Ladies and Gentlemen, dear friends, herzlich willkommen, Bruchim Mabaim, and a warm welcome to all of you. Bini Altstein from the Vulcani Center, Barbara Seimetz from the German Embassy in Tel Aviv, and I welcome you to our expert discussion on agricultural innovation and adaptation to climate change. We are especially honored to be joined by Germany's Federal Minister of Food and Agriculture, Julia Klöppner, Israel's Minister of Agriculture, Alon Schuster, Germany's Ambassador to Israel, Dr. Susanne Wasum Reiner, and Israel's Ambassador to Germany, Jeremy Sacharov. We are streaming this exciting event live from Israel. And without further ado, I'm happy to introduce you to our moderator of the event, the wonderful Hagid Schwimmer from the Israel Innovation Authority. Hagid, the stage is yours. Thank you, Andrea. It's great to be here. Good afternoon, everybody. Um, shalom, guten tag, all of you. So my name is Hagit Schwimmer. I'm from ISER, the Israel Europe Directorate in the Innovation Authority. Um, we work on the European Framework Program for Science and Innovation, Horizon 2020, um, to be followed by Horizon Europe. And I'm in charge, among others, on the fields of environment, energy, and agriculture. Our daily job is to encourage collaborations in science, research, and innovation. So I'm very happy to host this event today, especially because of my current involvement in working on the European Green Deal, the program that promotes with 20 call for proposals, now open for submission, better environment, cleaner, more sustainable, climate neutrality, better and healthier food, circular economy, and preservation of biodiversity, in all these topics, there's a crucial need for collaboration between experts and entities from different countries. Um, I also represent here Prima program, promoting research and innovation in the Mediterranean area. Both Israel and Germany are member states in this program um, that promote science and innovation in water management, farming and food. And collaboration between these two countries is definitely encouraged. Other platforms co for collaboration between Germany and Israel, like DEF, GEB, binational collaboration programs of MOST and BMBF and others, all these are excellent opportunities for collaboration between two partners and to be expanded into broad consortia, to be submitted to the Green Deal and other Horizon call for proposals. So this event is filled with great mix of greetings, scientific presentations, and most importantly, a declaration of collaboration between Vulcani and two research centers of the Helmholtz Association, Germany's largest scientific organization. In fact, Helmholtz believes so strongly in German-Israeli research cooperation that they decided to open an Israel office in Tel Aviv two years ago, and we really appreciate that. So I'm honored to moderate this event today, which will be kicked off with greetings from our guests of honor, um, who Andrea, Andrea already mentioned, followed by contributions from Helmholtz and Vulcani before leading scientists from all three institutes. We'll dive deeper into the collaborative research topics. After the expert, key, expert keynotes, there will be time for a quick round of question and answers, if time permits. Um, so we would ask you to share your questions for the scientists in the chat box which you can find on the bottom of the screen. Um, so let's get things started. So I would like to introduce you our first guest of honor, Julia Klückner, um, Germany's Federal Minister for, of Food and Agriculture, who unfortunately can't be with us um, in person today and delivered a greeting. We will hear um, the English translation of that. So please. Ladies and gentlemen, I would like to welcome you all very warmly to our digital workshop. Our ministries have been working together closely and effectively for many years. I'm referring to our bilateral agricultural research cooperation in particular. The German-Israeli Intergovernmental Agreement on Cooperation in the Area of Research on Agriculture and Nutrition has been in force since 2012. This research cooperation has the potential to develop joint solutions for climate smart 
and resource conserving agricultural sector that also makes use of state-of-the-art digital technologies. Yet, what exactly does digitalization in agriculture mean? It means that we can work more accurately and more efficiently, for example, by using agricultural machinery that spreads seed, fertilizer and plant protection products with satellite-based steering systems. Both the Israeli and the German agricultural sector are already at the forefront of innovation in many of these areas. What is crucial about digitalization, in my opinion, is that we always keep in mind the actual benefits. For this, we need knowledge and facts. This year, a total of almost 1 billion euro earmarked for expenditure in the fields of sustainability, research and innovation is at our disposal. That is the fourth largest budget of all federal ministries allocated to science, research and development. In the years to come, we will provide funding for a number of research projects relating to digitalization. For the next three years, a total of 50 million euros has been set aside for digital trial fields alone. Because we want to test digital technologies on site, in practice, to find out how they can best be applied. To protect the environment, improve animal welfare, conserve biodiversity and reduce workloads. And how they can, at the same time, help us save money. As an example, I have brought you a short video which you're going to watch in a minute. Startups also play a decisive role for us today. The proportion of startups participating in our innovation program has significantly increased over the last few years. This is an important signal. We need startups not only in metropolitan areas, but also in places where the agri-food industry has its roots. I am delighted that you have come together today to engage in a constructive exchange. This dialogue on the best ideas should be a firm link between our two countries, allowing us to identify and bring together Israelis and Germany's strength. I wish you all an interesting and successful conference. Thank you very much. Ja, hier haben wir einen deutlichen Befall. Pflanzenkrankheiten bedrohen die Erträge auf dem Feld. Es kommt aber auch dazu, dass Schädlinge vermehrt auftreten. Teilweise Schädlinge, für die noch gar keine Bekämpfungslösungen auch vorhanden sind. Und damit fehlen dem Landwirt auch Werkzeuge, um seine Pflanzen zu schützen. In unserem digitalen Experimentierfeld PharmaSpace beschäftigen wir uns mit Technologien, die dazu dienen sollen, Krankheiten zu erkennen, zum richtigen Zeitpunkt an der Stelle im Feld, um dem Landwirt Werkzeuge an Hand zu geben, um zum Beispiel eine teilflächenspezifische Behandlung durchzuführen und damit effizient eine Krankheit zu kontrollieren, aber auch Pflanzenschutzmittel zu reduzieren. Wir arbeiten mit unterschiedlichen Sensoren im Projekt. Einmal Temperatursensoren, die das Mikroklima des Bestandes erfassen, also Temperatur und Blattfeuchte zum Beispiel oder auch Bodentemperatur und Bodennässe. Und dann arbeiten wir mit Kameras, die Aufnahmen machen von den Feldern, zum Beispiel im thermischen Bereich und damit die Temperatur messen können oder die nicht nur im sichtbaren Bereich, sondern auch im Nahinfrarotbereich Informationen über die Pflanzen erkennen können, die dann wieder mit dem Auftreten von Stress und von Pflanzenkrankheiten eng verbunden sind. Wir liefern IoT-Sensoren, die in der Lage sind, die Temperaturen und Feuchten im Pflanzenbestand, in Weizen, in Zuckerrübe und auch im Boden in unterschiedlichen Tiefen zu erfassen. Dadurch werden ganz neue Datengenauigkeiten erreicht. Wir bekommen jeden Tag alle zehn Minuten Temperatur und Feuchte. Und das hilft den Forschern, genau zu sagen, wann infiziert eine Krankheit, an welcher Stelle und was muss der Landwirt machen, um diese Krankheit einzudämmen. Wenn wir in der Lage sind, mit solchen Technologien frühzeitig einen auftretenden Befall zu erkennen, dann kann die Pflanzenschutzmaßnahme zum richtigen Zeitpunkt durchgeführt werden und auch lokal in dem Bereich, wo es notwendig ist. Es kann also dazu führen, dass wir zukünftig nicht mehr das ganze Feld behandeln müssen, sondern sehr lokal und sehr präzise erste Befallsherde eindämmen können durch unterschiedliche Maßnahmen, auch zum Beispiel mechanische Maßnahmen, die hier dann zukünftig auch denkbar sind. Thank you, the, thank you, Minister. Um, our next speaker is the I Israeli Minister of Agriculture and Rural Development, Mr. Alon Schuster, please. Thank you. Dear Minister Kluckner, 
honorable ambassadors and director general, distinguished uh, researchers and guests. I'm very pleased to welcome all of you today, although I wish we could host this conference physically here in the agricultural center among fields, orchards, greenhouses, and laboratories, as I imagined it while answering your friendly and constructive, constructive letter, Minister Klockner. Your proposal to revive the high level discussion between our ministries reflected our longstanding bilateral cooperation uh, in the field of agriculture and was highly appreciated. George Bernard Shaw said once, if uh, you have an apple and I have an apple um, and we exchange these apples, then you and I will still uh, each uh, have one apple. But if you have an idea and I have uh, an idea and we exchange these ideas, then each of us will have two ideas. I truly believe in it. The German-Israeli joint researchers have already proven their ingenuity, and I hope that they will continue to do so, expanding the fields of cooperation for the benefit of our people and the entire world. Food security is a critical concern nowadays, especially with the COVID-19 pandemic, and they will become even more crucial in the future as the global population increases and natural resources dwindle. At the same time, there are challenging environmental issues and we have to look at agriculture with a holistic approach from farm to fork. Smart solutions for more efficient farming, sturdy crops, alternative sources of nutrition and safer food packaging and storage are essential by improving all aspects of supply chain, bringing better seeds, using less chemicals, new growing methods, improved packaging system, new methods of marketing fresh produce, the entire sector will use environmental friendly practices to bring fresher, more nutritious and better tasting products to the market. For this end, our farmers, both Israeli and German, are using advanced techniques such as precision agriculture, remote sensor, technologies for efficient water and irrigation management, robots, drones, and new varieties able to withstand stressful growing conditions. However, there is room for more research-based improvements and innovations that will take the industry a further step ahead. And we are happy for the opportunity of um, relaunching the high level discussion aimed in finding the right directions of the Germany-Israel collaboration. In this regard, I think that the, an MOU could be an instrumental to enable our experts collaborate more comfortably I agreed our teams can start exchanging, exchanging drafts at their convenience, knowing the professionalism at Volcani Center and impressed by the excellence of the German research centers, especially Helmholtz Center. I am sure that this conference will be a very fruitful and enjoyable one and I wish you all good health and hope to see you soon in the state of Israel. Thank you all. Thank you, Minister. Um, our next speaker is Dr. Susan Vazum Reiner, a German's ambassador to Israel. Please. Distinguished ministers for agricultural affairs from Germany and Israel, Minister Klöckner and Minister Schuster, Dear Jeremy, Ambassador of uh, Israel in Germany, Jeremy Isakarov, distinguished scientists from both our countries, distinguished experts and participants in today's online discussion on agricultural innovation 
and adaptation to climate change. 2020 is the year when Europe and the world are facing one of the greatest challenges during our lifetime. The COVID-19 pandemic has made it clear that we are vulnerable. Our health systems, our education systems, our economies, and our democrat democratic societies in Europe and around the world. And yet, we are aware, we should be aware, that there are other, even bigger challenges ahead of us, challenges for which there will be no vaccine. If the international community fails to fight global warming and climate change, we will find ourselves in a very unsettled world in the years to come. But what we are learning from the current crisis is that together we can successfully overcome these challenges if we just take joint and determined action to prepare for a resilient and sustainable future. Climate protection is one of the political priorities of the European Union. In December 2019, the EU heads of state and government committed themselves to the goal of climate neutrality by 2050. The European Union has its roots in the European coal and steel community. Coal and steel were once the basis for economic growth and better living conditions. This has changed. Today, our challenge is to make our industries and societies sustainable and future-proof. The European Green Deal is our modern growth strategy for a climate neutral and resource saving economy. And it shows us how a sustainable transformation can succeed. And agriculture plays a crucial role on our way to a climate neutral and resource saving economy. The agricultural sector can be seen as a key instrument for implementing the Green Deal and achieving its goals. In line with the goals of the Green Deal and as a roadmap for further initiatives, the European Commission has published two concrete strategies. The biodiversity strategy to better protect ecosystems and the farm to fork strategy to make food systems more sustainable. Under the German EU Council presidency, discussion on these strategies and on how the goals of the Green Deal can be implemented and combined with the instruments of the common agricultural policy are currently underway. Ladies and gentlemen, the Green Deal offers considerable chances, but also considerable challenges for the agricultural sector. We know that agriculture must continue to produce enough to feed a growing world population and provide it with good and healthy food. And it must do so under the conditions of climate change with more droughts and extreme weather conditions. We also know that agriculture should not be at the expense of the environment, biodiversity and soil fertility of further land use. To counter these challenges and to bring about necessary change, climate change and agricultural research and innovation are essential. With its extraordinary research and innovation landscape, Israel has been and is a prime partner of Germany and European researchers and research institutions. Both Israel and Germany hold leading positions worldwide in the field of research and innovation. Cooperation under the European Framework Programme and also within our bilateral framework can help to strengthen and even to expand this position in the long term for both of our countries. Therefore, Germany supports the full association of Israel under the Horizon Europe program. Today, within the bilateral framework, the Israeli Ministry for Agriculture and Rural Development and the German Ministry for Food and Agriculture expressed their commitment to continue and further strengthen their bonds under the bilateral governmental agreement for scientific technical cooperation 
in the area of agriculture and nutrition. And in line with this commitment, two of our most distinguished institutions are going ahead and join forces. The Volcani Center, Israel's most prestigious agricultural research institution, and the Helmholtz Association, Germany's largest organization for the promotion and funding of research, and two of its centers, the Research Center Jülich and the Helmholtz Center for Environmental Research, are signing MOUs with the Volcani Center today to explore potential future cooperation. And moreover, experts from Israel and Germany have gathered in this event to exchange their knowledge and their views on agricultural innovation and adaptation to climate change. Hereby, climate change and environmental challenges are not only seen as threats, but also as what they are, opportunities. And this is, of course, a promising approach. Please let me express in conclusion my sincere gratitude to all of you who are participating in today's important expert discussion and for exploring pathways to build a better future for all of us. Thank you very much to Daraba and a lot of success for your exchange today. Thank you, Ambassador. Um, and our next speaker is the Israel's ambassador to Germany, Mr. Jeremy Istachau, please. Thank you, thank you so much. For me, it's an incredible pleasure to be able to participate in this event today, alongside with uh, the Federal Minister of Agriculture, Food and Agriculture in Germany, Ms. Julia Glockner, and also uh, the uh, Minister of Agriculture of Israel, uh, Mr. Alon Schuster. And uh, I think um, it goes without saying, my colleague in, uh, in, uh, in Tel Aviv, uh, Ambassador Suzanne Wazum Reiner uh, is an amazing partner to have in this uh, incredible partnership that we've developed over the last uh, years. Um, and I think that uh, for me, this coming together uh, in on these issues, talking about climate change and agricultural cooperation in many different areas, agriculture covers a lot of areas. But uh, to me, we've had an amazing period of time where we've seen a tremendous amount of cooperation in the area of strategic exchanges between the two countries, defense cooperation, diplomatic cooperation, uh, intelligence exchanges, uh, mobility, startups, advanced scientific research in other areas. And to me, it was very much overdue that we should bring the cooperation in the area of agriculture um, and climate change onto our joint German-Israeli agenda. I think this is a really major issue of the day. And as everyone has said so far, obviously in a time of COVID and in the time of global warming, we're witnessing so many different trends that are happening in our societies that I think really uh, need to see this combination of Germany and Israel coming together. I found it incredibly interesting um, in recent visits to rhineland pfalz uh, the state in southwest uh, uh, Germany, and also in Thuringia just the other day. Uh, I met with the, the prime ministers of both states, and one of the first things they mentioned to me was the fact that the uh, forests and uh, uh, woodlands in these states, in rhineland pfalz it's 43% uh, of the land, uh, trees and they are suffering from an acute lack of rain precipitation uh, and it's become a major issue in Germany and I think the climate is affecting us in many ways in many profound ways it's affecting us in Israel even in Israel which is a hotter climate than Germany we are also suffering uh, the, uh, the higher temperatures this uh, summer that have been extremely high uh, and we have to find answers of how we go forward and I think this is an amazing way that Israel and Germany can complement each other with its premier institutions, both the Helmholtz Institution on one hand, which is an amazing uh, institution with tremendous knowledge and expertise, and obviously the Balkani uh, Institute in, uh, 
Israel, which whose name is really, uh, I think, has got a very great uh, global reputation for its uh, expertise in all of the different areas that we're talking about. Uh, and I think that, uh, again, this is an essential element of cooperation that Israel and Germany can put together. I think there are a lot of marvelous things that, that can be done. One of the things that I found works so well in the Israeli-German relationship is that we complement each other. And we provide expertise in different areas that each other has. And so it's not really a competition, but it is exactly as the minister said, Minister Schuster said, it's a combination of ideas. And I'm not sure that Israel has all the answers. I'm not sure that Germany has all the answers. But one thing I'm sure about is that together and with this cooperation, the, we can achieve amazing goals, have a great deal of uh, uh, realization of our common knowledge and, and uh, achieve uh, a very important factor in the Israeli-German relationship as a whole. So I would like to wish everyone participating in this event today uh, um, the best, uh, and I hope this is uh, clearly the starting point of many uh, joint and future endeavors that are absolutely essential to our common uh, uh, agenda. Thank you, and good luck. Thank you, Ambassador. Um, thank you to all our guests of honor. I just would like to remind you if you have any question to use the chat box and not the Q&A. It's very important. Use, please use the chat box at the bottom of your screen. So I'm now happy to continue um, with the next part of the program, the, the declaration of collaboration. And our next speaker is Dr. Nahum Itzkovich, Director General, Ministry of Agriculture and Rural Development, Israel. Please. Ministers and ambassador, friends and uh, colleagues, good afternoon. I feel privileged uh, to take part in this uh, important uh, conference and uh, would like to thank uh, the organizers for making it possible despite these uh, challenges a uh, day. This conference uh, reflects the great importance both of our ministers attribute to the agricultural research collaboration between Germany and Israel. I think we will all share the view that agriculture, agricultural cooperation between German and Israeli researchers is the field of agricultural hold a great potential for both our research community, but also for the benefit of all of us. As mentioned by Minister Schuster, we will, will be happy <clears throat> to find practical ways to join efforts in different fields, including agricultural research. The field of interest that can be supported by Israeli and German joint activities in agricultural development dedicated to the challenge of the climate changes, especially the climate changes. Innovation is the key of factor of all prosperity of both Israelis and Germans economy and agriculture. I am looking forward to discuss ways to enhancing the existing cooperation in agriculture between Israel and Germany. I wish you all successful and interesting conference, good health and all the best. Thank you. Shalom velitraot. Thank you, Dr. Itzkovich. Um, our next speaker is Professor Abed Gera, Acting Chief Scientist from the Ministry of Agriculture and Rural Development, Israel. Please. Thank you, uh, Hagit. Uh, Honorable uh, Minister of Agriculture, uh, Director General and Ambassadors, distinguished guests, colleagues, ladies and gentlemen, shalom, salam, and good intact. I wish to express my profound gratitude to the organizers, especially uh, Vini, Andrea, and Barbara for the privilege of addressing this German-Israeli binational meeting as a part of the cooperation between Helmholtz Association and the Volcani Center. Chief Scientist Fund uh, was established to advance, uh, foster, and fund research carried out by Israeli researcher at the academy and research institution 
The major goal are to identify agriculture challenges and problems in which uh, knowledge gaps exist to uh, determine uh, research goals aimed to bridge gaps and to fund such uh, research activities. We uh, monitor research performance in order to guarantee the implementation of the outcome uh, for the benefits of uh, farmers, public values, and uh, the environment. The uh, major uh, subjects that are currently uh, supported and controlled by the chief scientists include topics uh, dealing with uh, agricultural uh, biotechnology, uh, animal and food production, safety and quality, irrigation and water uh, management, post-harvest and sustainable agriculture, uh, plant and animal health aimed at uh, reducing the use of uh, pesticides. We believe uh, that the uh, COVID-19 uh, pandemic has underlined the importance of the robust and resilient uh, for uh, systems that functions in all uh, circumstances and is capable of ensuring access to sufficient supply of affordable food uh, for all citizens. It has also made us accurately aware of the interrelations between our health, ecosystem, supply chains, consumption uh, patterns, and uh, planetary uh, boundaries. Uh, the current pandemic is just one example, uh, the increasing recurrence of the drought, uh, forest, fires, and new emerging pests are a, a constant reminder that our food system is under threat and must become more sustainable and uh, resilient. Our strategy is oriented to address comprehensively the challenges of a sustainable food system and recognize the uh, inextricable links between healthy society and a healthy uh, planet in the uh, aftermath of COVID-19 pandemic and the uh, economic downturn, a shift to sustainable food system can bring environmental uh, health and uh, social benefits, offer economic gain and ensure that the recovery from the crisis put us into a sustainable uh, path. Climate change has been shown to have a number of uh, direct biophysical impact on agriculture, including changes in arable and uh, perennial crop and uh, pasture physiology, productivity and quality in water demand uh, for irrigation in weeds, pests and diseases with a possible head uh, stress effect on animal physiology, productivity and uh, reproduction. Uh, biological adaptation to climate change is already taking place through natural uh, uh, selection, biological invasions, and emerging uh, pests and diseases. And today, and mainly in the future, uh, uh, complex uh, climatic change, demographic growth, and energy context, uh, agricultural research uh, must deal with the uh, major issues on various scales to ensure uh, food security. We are offering uh, uh, forces, joining forces in uh, promoting a multidisciplinary synergistic research collaboration between uh, Germany and, and Israel. Soil and water, the natural resources that underpin uh, agriculture production are under continuous stress. Even every day, uh, approximately a thousand of uh, donums or hectares of land are lost from production because of uh, urbanization, degradation, uh, and desertification uh, processes. Land degradation coupled with the rapid human population growth result in a significant reduction in the level of uh, land per capita available for production. Fresh water is uh, also uh, scarce and insecure resources. The implications of the diminishing stocks of productive land and water are uh, severe uh, worldwide. The impacts of climate change are global in scope and exceptionally in a scale. Adaptation uh, to increased climatic variability may also imply an increased use of genetically uh, or genetic diversity in uh, uh, our farming systems. Achieving increased uh, adaptation will necessitate integration of uh, climate change 
related issue with the other factors such as uh, market risk, energy prices, consumer habits, uh, land and uh, water availability, and agriculture uh, policies. To meet uh, future challenges, new senses and new modes of uh, collaboration are uh, needed. Uh, optimization of agriculture production will re require uh, more novelty, uh, synergism, and uh, multidisciplinary research efforts. I believe that in uh, the current workshop, researchers from Israel and Germany uh, will share their research related to adaptation of, to climate changes, uh, research that addresses how plants and uh, animals can adapt or be adapted to grow in a changing environment, agriculture under arid condition, agriculture on marginal uh, soils, irrigation, using effluent and uh, saline water, farming under conditions of uh, water shortage and food security. The uh, vast diversity of the topic in this meeting reflects the wide scope in which collaboration can potentially increase farming efficiency and support sustainability of agriculture. We anticipate a, a direct research collaboration between Germany and Israel in the framework of a joint uh, binational call for uh, proposals, a synergistic multidisciplinary research uh, collaboration with the involvement of uh, uh, companies from uh, both uh, countries. In conclusion, uh, I would say that agriculture innovation are key drivers in accelerating the transition to sustainable, healthy, and inclusive uh, food uh, systems from primary uh, production to consumption. Research and innovation can help develop and test solutions, uh, overcome barriers, and uncover uh, new market opportunities. Uh, New knowledge and innovation will also scale up agroecological approaches in primary production through a dedicated partnership between Germany and, and Israel on agroecology living laboratories. This will contribute to reducing the use of uh, pesticides in agriculture, fertilizers, and antimicrobials, speed up uh, innovation, and accelerate knowledge transfer. I wish you all a uh, successful and enjoyable meeting with a lot of good sense and uh, some fun. Thank you very much. Thank you, Professor Guerra. So many options for collaboration and indeed a lot of fun. Um, our next speaker is Albert Wolf, Head of Directorate Research, Federal Ministry of Food and Agriculture, Germany. Please. Honorable ministers, ambassadors, and presidents of the participating uh, research institutions, ladies and gentlemen, in my capacity as the head of directorate research at the Federal Ministry of Agriculture, I would like to warmly welcome you to this digital work workshop and thank you very much for the invitation. My minister, Ms. Glöckner, already mentioned how well Germany and Israel have cooperated over the years. In particular, she underlined the important role of our bilateral agricultural research cooperation, which was initiated as a result of our bilateral intergovernmental agreement of 2012. Israel is the only country with which we have concluded this kind of agreement of agricultural research cooperation. So I think it is fair to say that Germany and Israel enjoy a special relationship in the field of joint agricultural research. Four research projects have been jointly supported. They have proven that our cooperation can be a great asset when we pool our expertise and facilitate mutual discussions between partners from different geographical regions. Not only is this cooperation beneficial for both of our countries, 
but also for the agricultural sector as a whole. The solutions that have been developed together will be key in realizing a resilient, climate-adapted, resource-friendly agricultural sector. Several of the research institutions present here today have played an important role in finding these solutions from the German side as well as from the Israeli side. The work of research institutions which belong to the Federal Ministry of Food and Agriculture has been particularly significant. A large portion of our research budget is spent on these institutes. These are the ministry's research institutes and further institutes associated with our ministry. My minister already pointed out how much money we spend on research every year. The institutes provide the scientific basis from which political decisions can be made within the ministry. And they are also well integrated within national and international scientific networks. Prior to today's event, we spoke with our departmental research institutes and together we identified topics which could be of interest for future bilateral cooperation between Germany and Israel. These topics could include plant protection or how to improve stress adaptation of our crops in light of climate change. The topic of climate change adaptation is also very important here in Germany. As Ambassador Isakharov already mentioned, especially the past two years have shown us how vulnerable German agriculture sector is when there are water shortages and shifts in growing seasons. Israel, of course, has much longer experience in this field and has achieved important progress, for example, in the efficiency of irrigation systems. I'm therefore pleased that the focus of today's workshop is climate change adaptations. I'm also glad that we are joined today by representatives from the Julius Kühn Institute, the Federal Research Institute for Arable Crops, and from the Thunen Institute, which conducts research in the fields of forestry, fisheries, and rural development. Both the Julius Kühn Institute and the Thunen Institute already cooperate closely with their Israeli counterpart institutions, including the Volcani Center. Other topics which are important for us are food quality and food safety, as well as animal health and animal disease control. All these topics have already been mentioned and we also recognize great potential for joint research and innovative activities. We are also joined today by staff from the German Ministry of Research and from my directorate. They will be following our discussions with interest and collecting new inspirations for further joint projects. I would be happy to see further opportunities for discussion and exchanging ideas arise between our ministries and research institutes following today's workshop. I hope that the successful cooperation in agricultural research between Germany and Israel will continue and that in, an, in the near future, we will put the intergovernmental agreement of 2012 into practice, focusing on relevant topics from the year 2020. I hope this will be a lively workshop which delivers new findings and great potential to further innovative ideas. And I would like to express my particular thanks to the Helmholtz Association for their in initiative in organizing this workshop. Thank you very much. Thank you. Um, our next speaker is Professor Otmar Wiesler, president of the Helmholtz Association, please.
Well, distinguished uh, guests, dear colleagues, um, it gives me great pleasure to um, welcome you to this um, exciting joint conference on behalf of the um, Helmholtz Association. Um, in this activity, we can build on a very special and long-standing relationship between Israeli and uh, German uh, scientists, um, which has been going on over decades. Um, um, in, in our special case, the Helmholtz Association, uh, we have um, um, supported long-standing interactions in areas such as uh, biomedical research um, with the first in this, I think dating back to the 70s in earth environment and climate the topic of today air and space and transportation energy research or information technologies and information uh, processing um, uh, only during the last couple of years uh, we have uh, considerably expanded some of these um, uh, initiatives. Uh, we have established new um, uh, joint research schools, uh, set up three international Helmholtz laboratories uh, in Israel, and of course decided to open uh, an office um, in, in Tel Aviv um, back in 2018. Uh, all of this because we feel for us Israel is a very special and very powerful uh, partner in research and innovation, highly complementary uh, in, in many of our um, uh, research activities. Now, in the area of today's workshop, that is agriculture and nutrition, we can certainly build on the agreement to governments uh, back in 2012. And uh, I, I'm very glad to learn that uh, we will renew this. A bilateral agreement um, uh, with our joint sort of activity here um, uh, uh, today. Um, uh, and I, I, I very much endorse um, and, and look forward to the upcoming collaboration between the Volcani Center and the colleagues uh, from Jülich and, and Leipzig on the um, um, uh, Helmholtz um, site. Now, um, today we are all very much affected by the uh, COVID-19 um, a, a pandemic. Um, but once this pandemic is successfully mastered, um, a climate ch change will return and probably most important uh, task um, uh, ahead of us. And um, um, for mastering the many challenges of, of climate change, uh, uh, this new cooperation between uh, Volcani, um, the Helmholtz centers and additional partners uh, can play a really important um, um, a con contribution. Um, the, um, the partners are highly uh, complementary um, and, and I think um, uh, provide all the basis for an ideal sort of new uh, pass uh, for, for cooperation. Uh, Volcani, with all its expertise in climate change and, and agriculture and um, all the know-how in technology development on one side, um, the center in Jülich, um, with all the um, expertise in information processing, uh, supercomputing, uh, in bio and in cutting edge energy research, as well as the colleagues in Leipzig, who are uh, one of the leading centers in, environment, in environmental research, um, um, focusing on issues such as sustainable uh, ecosystems, water resources, and of course, the uh, interplay between uh, humans and their um, and environment. And I think this combination promises to um, uh, promote a real new era in cooperation between our institutions in this uh, exciting uh, future research field. I think it's a good idea to establish uh, potential collaborations um, in the setting of uh, meetings um, and workshops to define, define potential fields um, 
for this um, future interaction. And I do hope, of course, very much that this activity will also um, uh, exchange and cooperations between junior scientists uh, in, in, in particular, um, which are a very important sort of group of um, 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 colleagues uh, to promote this um, a new uh, relationship. Um, I would like to thank uh, both governments, first of all, for um, providing the basis and the framework uh, for, for the cooperation. I would very much like to acknowledge the scientists from Volcani, but also from the centers in Jülich and um, um, uh, Leipzig, because they will make this happen uh, in the end. Um, but let me also thank uh, Hagi Schwimmer and Andrea Fram, who have put a lot of effort into um, sort of uh, establishing this workshop, but also uh, encouraging the scientists to uh, um, enter into cooperations. Um, with this, I would like to wish you all the best, and I'm very much looking forward to exciting uh, research uh, results in um, this highly relevant area. Uh, for both of our countries. Thank you very much. Thank you, Professor Wiesler. Um, our next speaker is Professor Eli Feinerman, the head of the Agriculture Research Organization. Please. Honorable ministers and ambassadors, distinguished participants, I would like to devote my five minutes to introduce, uh, to use a bride, namely Vulcani Institute. Vulcani is an agricultural research organization of Israel. It was established 100 years ago, and it is a research arm of the Ministry of uh, Agriculture. It is also known as Vulcani Center, named after its founder, Professor Eliezer Vulcani. Vulcani is the largest, oldest, and leading agricultural research, research institute in Israel. We have three campuses. The main one located in Rishon Lezion, in the center of the country, not far from Tel Aviv. We have one campus in the north, not far from Haifa, which focuses on sustainable agriculture and healthy food, and one campus in the south, located not far from Beersheba, which is focusing on uh, agriculture on the edge of the desert. We have close relationships, working relationships, with the Center of Mari Culture or Aquaculture uh, Center in Elat, located on the shore of the Red Sea, which is in the process of joining Vulcani. We have 200 scientists, researchers. Each one of them is a, a leader. Each one of them is a leader of a scientific team. Each team is composed of research assistants, graduate students, PhD and master students from universities all over the Israel and from postdocs, uh, most of them from, uh, from abroad. Vulcani is divided into, is composed of six research uh, institutes, soil, water and environmental sciences, plant sciences, plant protection, post harvest and food sciences, animal sciences and agricultural engineering. At any given time, we have about six to 700 target-oriented studies that are being conducted here. And all this uh, wide range of studies cover almost everything that one can imagine in the fields of agriculture and agriculture and environment and resources, agriculture and food, agriculture and health, agriculture and industry, agriculture and international relations. One comment about research, uh, Israel is uh, actually a good natural laboratory for agricultural research. It is very diverse, very small country, but very diverse, different soil types, different water types, weather condition, 
different landscape within close proximity. And uh, the research that we conducted here in the diverse region of, small, of our small country is suitable for farmers all over the globe. Uh, we have a wide scale of research from drones and satellites in the space till the tip of the, of the root of a wheat. Uh, and uh, we have, uh, we cover really a very, very, very wide range and from a molecular, molecular level to the, of uh, one uh, cell, one, uh, uh, one gene to the whole plant, the whole cow, the whole animal, the whole region, the whole country. Beyond research, I would like to uh, present to you, we have unit, of, uh, unit for science-oriented use. High school students and their teachers are educated here, study agricultural, research, uh, agricultural uh, uh, topics. The Israeli gene bank is located in Vulcani, and we have technology transfer, very active technology transfer unit called Kidum. Uh, I strongly believe that collaboration between our two institutions is very, very promising, and the fruits of our cooperation will be of great value, not only for Germany and Israel, but for billions of citizens of the people all over the globe. Uh, thank you very much. Yeah. Thank you. Um, thank you, Professor Feinerman. I would like, um, just would like to say um, warm, warm welcome um, to Eric Zimmerman, um, the new GIF director, the, whom I haven't mentioned in the beginning. We're very honored to have you here as our guest. Thank you. And so thank you to um, all the speakers. It's very exciting to hear everybody. Um, but next up is our keynote lecture by Professor Ulrich Schur, who is going to talk about quantitative approaches to improvements of crop and agricultural systems for a changing climate. Please, Professor Schur. Thank you very much uh, and welcome distinguished guests. Oops, let's go here. Um, thank you very much for the opportunity to talk to you today about uh, quantitative approaches to improve crop and agricultural systems in a changing climate, which is definitely a very important topic, which we can also move on in the future with together with the Volcani Center. I don't think I have to go into extremely details with the challenges of agriculture in the 21st century, because many of the speakers before have already mentioned many of them. Therefore, I just want to shortly summarize the great challenges which we have ahead of us. On the one hand, we have to look at the environment. We see more and more weather extremes and climate extremes which are affecting crops. We have the water use and the contamination of water bodies, which are very important. Uh, agriculture is a very important participant in. And we see a strong decline in biodiversity, which also is affecting agriculture and which agriculture is also a reason for. At the same time, we see a very much increasing demand increasing demand in food and in non-food demands. At the same time for both, for food and non-food demand, we want to have increased quality and increased diversity. And not to forget food waste and the loss of food which we have after the production has taken place. All of these are topics which are obviously very good interactions possible together with Israel and with the Volcani Center. All of them, however, ask for a integrated systematic approach because there is no single solution solution which is sufficient but we need to integrate and have significant impact we need to have integrated land use management and we opt have to optimize the entire food feed non-food system together with the water energy agri-nexus and this is asking for a central circular agri and bioeconomy as a central element in what we use say in the european level on a green deal so these are the challenges which we have ahead of us. But we have to talk about solutions, about options which we have. And obviously the traditional activities towards breeding and crop management are towards yield and quality to improve uh, the potential and active and, and actual uh, yield and quality of crops. 
At the same time, we have to work on the inputs. We have to reduce fertilizers and chemicals and water input into the agricultural systems through management and through different measures which we can build on. For all these, we need to have quantitative data, quantitative and innovative data and solutions which are delivering into breeding and management. And there are main, mainly three different areas where we use them. One is to understand the systems, to understand the crops and to understand the agricultural systems. The second, to design them in a new and proper way. And last but not least, to manage the entire systems in order to achieve uh, on the one hand yield and on, on quality, and on the other hand, to reduce the impact on the environment. And uh, obviously the task which uh, is given to me today to talk to you in the keynote about quantitative data, I can only scratch the surface of options which are there. And therefore I have to give you some examples. And the first example on the understanding where we see very important improvements in the past is about crop functioning under dynamic conditions of global change. And the example which I want to use here is root performance, which is very important because the root is the, the organ of the plant, which is taking up water and nutrients and therefore determines a lot of the resource use efficiency. We have, on the, in order to achieve these improvements, we have to, on the one hand, develop and apply unique technology. And both Germany and Israel are very great, have very great history in this. We then have to quantify and model the crop performance in specific context. And I'll give you some examples on this later on. And secondly, then, and then continue towards testing genotypes at future climates in stressful climates and then also putting them into genetic markers and idiotypes. And then we have to pass over these activities and these results to breeding uh, programs. And in Germany, this is op often breeding companies, but also breeding uh, uh, projects in general. So to give you an example on the technology, we have developed in the past unique tomographic technologies for root analysis in situ. The root is the part of the plant which is in the soil, therefore we can't see it. And therefore we use two uh, technologies and further improved technologies, which you usually have experience in, in medicine. The magnetic resonance imaging and positron emission tomography. These two technologies give us the opportunity to study the root in situ, which means in the soil with respect to their structure, as well as with their function with respect to carbon transport. The combination of both gives us a 3D trade co-registration, which allows to generate new opportunities for breeders to develop uh, new traits. This results in things like this, which you see here. This is a time frame of uh, roughly two hours where we can see how carbon actually flows into root systems, into root systems of the same specimen at three different days during the development, six days, 13 days, and 20 days. So this non-invasive technology for the first time gives us the opportunity to learn what actually happens below ground, which is extremely important for the uh, uh, response of plants to the environment and how the plants take up nutrients and water from the environment. We then have to test and understand how systems work in the, in the field. There also we have specific uh, uh, facilities which we uh, use quite nicely at the moment for testing many different genotypes because many different genotypes are needed for breeding. And we are putting this in the context of a CO2 concentration in the field. So we mimic the future CO2 concentration in the field using our breed phase facility. This is also linked to a state-of-the-art field phenotyping devices, which you can see here as well. This is a kind of 3D scanner, which gives us very detailed information about yield, photosynthetic traits, water relations, structural traits, but also about insects and pests at, the at future CO2 concentrations in the field in Germany. We can then put this next into the next steps by using agro-robotics. And we have uh, recently formed with the funding of the German uh, uh, Science Foundation an excellence cluster in agro-robotics, where we combine our quantification on phenotypes and environment from, this, from the level of single plants up to the level of the, of the satellites and global with robotics, sensing, and machine learning to get, to get quantitative data out of this data. But this is not enough. We have to combine it with analysis at multi-scales about economic, ecological, and social impact of these new technologies in order to be able to build this into a bigger context and to generate impact in the real world. 
We built this now into a whole, whole digital farming landscape, also in collaboration with colleagues from the BML, uh, with, uh, in collaboration with 5G technologies, artificial intelligence, and data sciences. So many of these new technologies have direct implications for the activities which we do in agriculture. In the next step, we go beyond uh, the German level. And I want to shortly mention here the emphasis uh, S3 project, which we have, where at the moment we are building a pan-European plant phenotyping research infrastructure. This addresses controlled environments, intensive and lean field environments, modeling and data and computational services, which are provided with this research infrastructure. We, are, we have in the decision body at the moment 12 different governments from Europe, and we are also happy that we have additional countries, including Israel and the Volcani Center, associated to this uh, European research infrastructure. We then have to design how things are developing. And for, uh, an important topic for that, obviously, is to use biodiversity for climate adaptation, because many of the natural plants of the wild plants have opportunities to work on different climates. And herefore, we use bioinformatics to implement new crop traits. We identify and use heritable properties of wild species, for example, tomatoes, and this has also very strong interaction there with Israel. We then do sequencing, and we did the first nanopore, nanopore sequencing with uh, new technology for tomatoes in, in plants and combine this with phenotyping technologies. And by doing this, we can generate a plant genetic analysis framework, which allows us to improve crop resistance in future climates. This is design opportunities which we have to use also in the future. Again, here we have an excellence cluster, which is also uh, following along that line of design, where we use biodiversity to crop traits for crop development, primary production, metabolism, but also integrate a microbiome in the biome of the soil, which is a very important part of the overall performance in the, in the environment. Combining with synthetic biology and theoretical biology, this gives new opportunities to design crops from scratch to the future developments. We also have to think about non-food non uh, applications, and therefore we utilize renewable carbon sources to value, for value-added products. We can use diverse feedstocks and residues, and we have to use them in order to make more, more efficient renewable crops, renewable products. We build modular, hybrid, and biotechnology processes from biotransformation, enzyme cascades, and chemical synthesis, and they will also have some examples on this later on, in order to produce low footprint and environmentally friendly products. This is also a very important part of our bioeconomy efforts. And last but not least, we also have to manage the entire agrobiology systems. We have to quantify the environmental impact, the control and the feedback loops which are there in the environment in order to run the agrobiology systems in a proper way. We have to develop and integrate multi-scale observation simulation platforms where we are already extremely active in doing this in the field and to fundamentally understand biochemical processes across scales from small, small field, uh, field parts to the globe. This will give us the opportunity to target ecosystem functions to reduce anthropogenic impact and to design sustainable management of crop protection systems in collaboration with our colleagues in Israel and in Germany. Again, here we have um, S3 project, which is running a long-term ecosystem research, the ELTER, where the mission is to track and understand the effects of change on socioeconomic systems, including agriculture, and the feedback to environment and society. This will also provide recommendations and support for solving current and future environmental problems by networking, research and development, and infrastructure. Ladies and gentlemen, I hope that I could use the last 15 minutes to give you a short overview of what kind of quantitative approaches are there to improve crops and agricultural systems in the changing climate, and how many links there are to the work between here, what we do in Germany, with the colleagues in Israel, specifically with the Vulcani Center. And I'm looking forward for the implementation of our MOU in the future and close collaboration. Thanks very much. Thank you so much, Professor Sho. Indeed, um, really exciting. Um, so now we're moving to the next part of the program. I'm very happy to introduce you the three research centers 
who will actually join forces and kick off the bilateral research cooperation from Helmholtz in Germany. Um, we have the research center FZ Hulich, um, the UFZ Helmholtz Center for Environmental Research, and from Israel, Volcani Center, the Agriculture Research Organization. So please welcome our first speaker, Professor Wolfgang Marquardt, um, the Vice President of the Helmholtz Association, Chairman of the Board of Directors, FZ Hulich, please. It's my pleasure to be part of today's meeting to revive the collaboration plans of Helmholtz and Volcani Center. A very warm welcome on behalf of the leadership of Forschungszentrum Jülich. This joint undertaking between Helmholtz and Volcani Center enjoys our strongest attention. We are all committed to make this effort a success. The transition from a fossil-based to a bio-based economy while well accounted for the constrained resources of our planet and continuing to produce efficient food for a growing world population in changing climate is the key challenge for our and future generations. Forschungszentrum Jülich has therefore identified bioeconomy as one of its strategic research areas with its interdisciplinary research on biological systems and biogeosystems, our scientists make important contributions to the scientific foundation for a sustainable bioeconomy and to the translation of research results into practice. Our research covers the sustainable production of food, of biological energy carriers, chemicals, pharmaceuticals, and materials by plant and microbial processes or principles. It aims at the sustainable use of natural resources, in particular of soil and water, and it emphasizes the quantitative analysis and optimization of circular material and energy flows. The Plant Sciences Institute develops sustainable solutions utilizing plants and plant biomass as raw materials, in particular innovative use and production concepts, as well as state-of-the-art sensing and automation technologies from the laboratory to the field, ground-based and airborne are under investigation. The trans and multidisciplinary research on resource utilization, efficiency and sustainability has always been strongly relying on alliances with diverse scientific partner institution both locally and internationally. The Agrosphere Institute focuses on the development of management and adaptation strategies to cope with climate and land use changes. The development of these strategies is, however, hampered by our limited ability to predict states and fluxes in terrestrial systems at scales which are relevant for land use management. This scientific and technical challenge constitutes the main target of the research activities of the Institute. The sustainable production of crops and raw biomass is a cornerstone of future bio-based economy, and it is an overarching and common theme that unifies the scientific activities at Forschungszentrum Jülich and Volcani Center. Discovery-oriented research and the development of technologies in plant sciences, agrogeosciences and biotechnology link science and engineering with digitalization in both institutions. The topics selected for collaborative research work and agreed on in the Memorandum of Understanding between Forschungszentrum Jülich and Volcani Center are improving water and nutrient efficiencies in agricultural systems, the sustainable use of water and soil resources, crop improvement, crop protection and phenotyping in a dynamic environmental change. These topics set the stage for the scientists at both of our institutions to join efforts in order to achieve new insights and generate new understanding which lead to innovative technological breakthroughs. The exploitation of scientific progress for economic, ecological, and societal innovation is key to overcome the societal challenges ahead of us. 
I wish this endeavor all the best and a bright future and the scientists involved success and fun in their collaboration. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Professor Marquardt. Um, we will continue with Professor Georg Teutsch, Scientific Director of the Helmholtz Center for Environmental Research. Please, Professor Teutsch. Good afternoon. My name is Georg Teutsch. I'm the Scientific Director of the UFZ, the Helmholtz Center for Environmental Research here in Leipzig, Germany. And it is my pleasure to express our interest in intensifying the collaboration with our friends from the Volcani Center in Israel in the field of agriculture innovation and adaptation to climate change, the subject of today's workshop. Let me be more specific. There is no doubt in the scientific community and throughout most of the reasonable people worldwide that climate change is taking place at an increasing rate or increasing uh, pace affecting all aspects of our lives already today. Even in places which are supposedly spared from dramatic changes like Germany, we could see and feel already dramatic changes like the number of extreme events, heat, droughts and storms, heavy rains, like in 218, 219 and 220 again. We are expecting that the irrigated land in Germany will increase from less than 3% today to more than 80% in about 30 to 50 years. And this will, of course, dramatically change the agro-system and also the water management, in other words, the water system, the water cycle. Consequently, we are interested to work together with scientists from a country which had the, overcome the problem of scarcity, water scarcity, in various sectors already some decades ago. The OZ has world-class scientific expertise in the field of hydrology, with the ability to produce robust future scenarios of water availability and subsequent impacts from local to regional and even global scale. This sets the stage for a series of exciting collaborations which will be presented today in the field of water movement and water management in soils and under semi-arid and arid conditions by Professor Vogel. It sets the stage for innovative sensor technologies and monitoring uh, in all fields uh, related to soil and land coverage. This is not an extra presentation but an important subject in the UFZ. And with respect to sustainable solutions for the energy transformation, we need also to meet the mitigation targets set for, set for uh, 2050. That is, we are interested, and this is the consequence, in the valorization of agricultural waste streams for the production of fuels and chemicals by microbial and electrochemical conversion. And this subject is presented by Professor Harnish in the workshop today as well. I do wish the participants fruitful discussions and good productivity and look forward to the outcome of this workshop. Thank you very much and have a good day. Thank you. We are also looking forward to see the outcomes of this workshop. Um, our next speaker is Professor Vini Alstein, prof um, project coordinator from Vulcani Center. Please. Thank you very much, Hagit, and thanks very much to our colleagues from ULICH and UFZ for the effort to establish the collaboration, which we are mostly happy and enthusiastic to carry out together. Um, agricultural innovation and adaptation to climate change was chosen as the area for collaboration based on the global importance and the large volume of research that is being carried out in both Helmholtz institutes as well as at Vulcani. Vulcani or ARO, Agricultural Research Organization, carries out over 120 projects 
on the effect of climate changes and adaptation to climate change of different crops and the effect on the environment. As Professor Feinerman indicated, Israel is a natural laboratory because of the different climatic regions, soils, uh, precipitation, etc., which enables growth of a large variety of crops under varying conditions. Nearly 60% of Israeli land is considered arid or semi-arid, so there is no wonder that we put a lot of emphasis um, to, uh, to study those topics. In the course of the uh, correspondence and discussions that we had with Yulich and UFZ, we came up with six areas which can serve as a basis for collaboration. Sustainable use of water and soil resources, improving water and nutrient efficiencies in agricultural systems, crop improvement, valorization of agricultural waste streams, phenotypic in dynamic environmental changes and crop protection. In the next few slides, I will uh, cover some of those, I will cover those topics and will highlight some of the projects that are being carried out uh, with respect to um, uh, those areas of research. Um, two of those topics will be covered by um, other colleagues from um, the volcanic. The first two topics on sustainable use of water and soil resources and improving water and nutrient efficiencies in agricultural systems is the main research topic of the Institute of Soil, Water and Environmental Sciences, which focuses on environmental and uh, uh, issues, physics and irrigation, as well as soil chemistry and plant nutrition. Research topics that are being carried out under, okay, our research topic under, our research projects under those two topics will be presented by uh, Dr. Alon Bengal from this institute who works in the southern branch of um, uh, Vulcani, the Gilat Center that focuses on agriculture at the edge of the desert. The second topic, crop improvement, um, is the focus of the studies in the Institute of Plant Sciences and um, a presentation on tolerance to abiotic stress, high temperatures, drought, and high salinity of various crops will be introduced by Dr. Ilan Levine, um, the former um, uh, head of this institute. Valorization of agricultural waste stream is the main topic um, of a model, model farm that has been established a few years ago in the northern branch of uh, Vulcani, Nevea Research Center, that focuses on sustainable agriculture. Within this model farm, a laboratory that deals with waste to resource issues has been established and the laboratory focuses on recovery of valuable resources from agricultural waste while minimizing emission of um, uh, carbon. There are different topics and research projects that are studied in this lab. Some examples are conversion of waste to energy, conversion of waste to nutrients, conversion of waste to different materials where waste sources are sewage, sludge, farm animal uh, waste, food waste, agricultural waste, plastic, etc. And the products that are obtained on top of energy are fertilizers, biochar, animal feed, herbicides, antifungal compounds, etc., etc. Phenotyping in dynamic environmental changes is the focus of the Institute of Agricultural Engineering, where scientists focus on studies in the fields of sensing, robotics, information and mechanization, as well as environmental engineering. 
there are different approaches that are being used for phenotyping, such as spatial epidemiology, drone and satellite imaging, spectral reflectance in the visible and near infrared, spectral analysis and thermal images, artificial intelligence assisted visual phenotyping, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. And there, there are uh, projects which focus on development of optical systems and algorithms for improved resolutions of the images obtained by the above approaches. The applications of uh, the approaches that are being used are monitoring crop pathogen with interaction, crop water usage, early detection of abiotic stress and abiotic resilience, monitoring pathogen infestation, and this is to mention just a few. Last but not least is the crop protection uh, topic, which is the focus of the Institute of Plant Protection, where entomologists, nematologists, chemists, plant pathologists, and weed research scientists focus on development of approaches and compounds to reduce the use of toxic pesticides um, and um, uh, trying to find natural compounds and environment-friendly compounds that can eliminate the use of toxic pesticides. Vulcani is a very special research institute and Professor Feinerman mentioned that the studies span all the way from basic to applied research. We carry out a lot of multidisciplinary research projects. We integrate cut edge technologies and we carry out a lot of collaborations with the academia nationally and internationally with regional countries and not less important is the collaboration with extension services, R&D regional centers, centers and farmers, which enable, uh, which enable us to get information on emerging problems in agriculture and environment that needs uh, to be solved. We welcome warmly and enthusiastically the forthcoming collaboration with ULIF and UFZ. And we envision that the collaboration will be synergistic and fruitful and will result in innovative solutions, technologies, protocols, and will help to cope with climate changes, which will be of great benefit to Germany, Israel, and could be scaled up worldwide. Thank you very much for your attention. Thank you, Professor Alstein, also Professor Toj and Professor Marquard. Now it's the time to dive deeper into the research topics. So please, this is the time for you, the researchers in the audience, to listen very carefully to the speakers and to think how to collaborate. Maybe you have a joint interest or a complementary expertise. Maybe joining forces can lead to a very fruitful and interesting synergy, so think about it while listening. So, our first speaker in the expert panel um, is Professor Falk Harnisch from the Ufzet Helmholtz Center for Environmental Research uh, with the title of Valorization of Agricultural Waste Streams for the Production of Fuels and Chemicals by Microbial and Electrochemical Conversion. Please, Professor Harnish. Dear Excellencies, dear uh, colleagues, I'm very happy now to be the first speaker on this uh, very excellent panel, and I'm happy to represent the Helmholtz Center of Environmental Research, UFZ, and I would like to give you some examples how we want to mitigate climate change by developing new technologies in, in the realm of biotechnology, but with this very special spark here because we want also to introduce electrochemical technologies. So, and I will give you two examples here that are following one line, but uh, I want to stress here that this is just to emphasize our overall capabilities we have here. And there are many more interesting things we would like to yeah, go deeper with you after this workshop. So what is the status quo that we have and we, when we talk about biorefineries? This is, we have a strong competition of fuel and chemical production with the production of food and feed. 
we have a limited product portfolio, meaning the only very few products that are usually made petrochemically are nowadays produced from biomass. And this is a very special thing that I think should be addressed is we have a quite limited connection or linking between the re renewable energy sector and the sector of just bio-based production. And all this can be changed from my perspective by interlinking the renewable electric energy sector and the utilization of um, uh, biomass for production of chemicals and fuels by so-called electro biorefineries. And without going too much into detail here is meaning that we use electric energy to drive biological reactions or that we can extract electric energy from bio-based compounds, especially from waste. And you see here, um, a picture of yeah, several linkages that can be created between these two realms. And I want to give you two examples here. One is without electrochemistry, the other one is with electrochemistry. And this are, yeah, is very exemplary work that we here do at the Helmholtz Center for Environmental Research, the U of Z. And first I want to talk about new anaerobic fermentation technologies that are located here in our process pipeline. And I think all of you know what biogas production is. This means we are breaking down complex biomass by two biological processes called hydrolysis and acetogenesis into bricks or building blocks. And these are by two subsequent processes, acetogenesis and methanogenesis, uh, uh, microbially converted into a very interesting product. And this is methane. But however, I we methane is one interesting product, but maybe not the product that you want to go for. And if we inhibit methanogenesis, then we don't have the further production of methane, of course, but we have the production of so-called medium chain carboxylic acids. So this can be things like that we all know, butyric acids so very smelly ones, but also caproic acid, or on the other side also, um, 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 also uh, acetic acid, so it's not very much of use, but all these acids are produced by a purely microbiological process called microbial chain elongation. And here for the biochemists is the so-called bet reverse beta oxidation. So, but the interesting thing is that we can use almost all complex biomasses for generating these acids. And why this is interesting from an economic point of view, you can see here, these are some of these uh, acids, so acetic acid, butyric acid, caproic acid, caprylic acid, and some other more. And all of them have a certain value. So in here it's shown in US dollars per kilogram of biomass. And what is at the moment a little bit tricky, and this gives us a lot of interesting research question is how to purify this respective product. So we can see the most val valuable products like caproic acid, the purification is easy, but it's not so easy to get all the biomass into this caproate. And whereas uh, the separation of something like butyrate is hard, but it's easier to get butyrate. And we are working here on a very on interesting processes, how to especially produce C6 and C8, meaning um, caproic and caprylic acid. And they are very interesting and they have a very high value also because they can potentially replace, replace palm oil and other fossil resources. They can be used as energy carriers if reduced to alcohols. And as you will see in a minute, they are also very interesting platform chemicals. And this is work that you will not only find in the UFZ, but also in a lot of other academia and even industry nowadays worldwide. Um, because this is of great interest if you have these acids, these medium chain carboxylic acids with a certain value that I gave you examples for, you can further process in very interesting products. So for the chemists, here you see some possibilities, but also for the more practical people and engineers, so it's flavoring agents, it can be fodder additive, it can be food crane sanitizer, and it can also be in the converted into a surfactant and so in a biofuel. So it's a true platform chemical. And here at the U of Z, we 
we, meaning our, my colleagues here, so not me, myself, um, have developed a process, the so-called capra Fern process. This is, was invented by the Helmholtz Center for Environmental Research, UFZ, but also by the DBFZ. So it's a nearby, we have the German Biomass Research Center here, and we work with them on a local scale very, very closely together. And they found a process that allows them by continuous anaerobic fermentation to make these acids that I just spoke about, C6 and C8, from complex biomass with open, bio, with open microbiota, meaning no need for sterilization. You just take the waste, put it in the reactor, and then you can make uh, the product without any further uh, pretreatment. And they have shown that this can be done by from, uh, from different feedstock, starting from dedicated crops, but, uh, but also agro-industrial and municipal waste by an intelligent process control without the addition of chemicals. The methane process that could also take place at these reactors can be inhibited because it's a very intelligent process control. It can be different reactor types used. And this is very interesting from a personal perspective. It can be integrated into existing infrastructure uh, like existing biogas plants. And here you can see for example, they've used this so-called bio-based bins that we are very popular here in Germany and use this waste that people just throw away here in a local municipality to make this interesting chemical. And this can, for instance, now uh, um, be used for make lubricants. But the acid may be not the ultimate product. And here I want to show you an opportunity where electrochemistry comes into play. And this is the second example I decided to show you now. So we have here an electrochemical upgrading. And this means we still have a renewable substrate. This is converted by a bioprocess. In this example now, it's almost the same process uh, like the capra ferm process that you have seen before. So we make from complex biomass, we make organic acids, then they are separated. And finally, electrochemical upgrading to products takes place. This can be liquid or also gaseous products. And the only further energy source that we need here is renewable uh, electric energy. So we just feed electrons or electric current. So, and a little bit more detail for the people interested in, we did this on a waste product from the ethanol industry being corn beer. We converted more than half of the carbon into this MCCAs, into these acids, and finally, we then use an electrochemical reaction to gain a mixture of alkanes. And getting a mixture of alkanes may be not so, yeah, so I mean not, may sound not so interesting, but you have to be aware that this, this mix, mixture of alkanes is separating itself from an aqueous process solution and it's swimming on top here. And you can see this in a lab scale and the measuring cylinder. And it's very, very energy dense. So, and this substance that you can gain there by this combined biological and electrochemical process can, can be directly put into a car engine or an, an, an combustion engine in general to serve as a drop in fuel additive. And over the whole process line in the up to 10 liter scale, we had a carbon yield of more than 50%, meaning more than 50% of the carbon that was in very complex biomass and waste finally ended up in, um, in the drop, drop in fuel. And if you prospect the cost there, very, very roughly without any just uh, taxes and so on, we have a cost of about $1.37 per liter. We know that is quite already high, but it's not factor 10 or so higher. And with these two examples, I hope to have a little bit uh, risen your interest and uh, I want to have you the following take home messages. We at the U of Z, we are working on the future of electro biorefineries. We are working, I didn't went into detail on this today, on the screening of, breed, uh, of feedstock, on the screening, utilization, engineering of microbial resources. We are working also on electrochemical uh, conversions and also electroorganic synthesis. And we are not only doing this in a small test tube, we want to bring this into a technical relevant scale. And this we do it, for instance, with, with partners from all over the world. And we are always interested in developing new process lines. And I think 
this is also something where we and we meaning special specifically myself but also my colleagues Sabine Kleinstoiber um, who is head of the microbial uh, uh, microbiology anaerobic systems group here in the same department as I'm working in yeah I would like to engage with you and find hopefully mutual interested and maybe also lines for a joint future research agenda and I'm thanking you for your intention and have We'll be happy to take your questions later on. Thank you, Professor Harnish. Um, great, great work. So our next speaker is Dr. Alon Bengal from Gilad Center um, from the Agriculture Research Organization, please. Um, with the title, Irrigation Water Quality Effects on Soils, Crops and yeah. Research Use Efficiencies. Yes, thank you. I'd like to talk uh, a little bit about research concerning irrigation water quality. Uh, I want to give a wide perspective focusing on Israel uh, ARO experience, interests, and, and strengths around it. I think that'll lead to further discussion about potential cooperation. So not all of Israel's uh, landscape looks like this, uh, but a lot of it does. And uh, the whole country is actually characterized by very low rainfall, high water demand for plants and crops and scarce water for irrigation. And in spite of that, we've been fairly successful in taking those landscapes uh, in the desert areas and throughout the country and converting them into successful uh, agriculture, uh, in, including in the most extreme areas. There are a lot of reasons for the success uh, for it agriculture in Israel, including in these dry area. I want to focus just on a couple of the, the water related driving principles for, for success. Uh, one of them is intensification, modernization of agricultural systems, meaning the development and adoption of efficient water application technologies. We're mostly talking here about move early and full move to pressurized efficient sprinkler and drip irrigation technologies. And that combined with smart data-driven irrigation scheduling, but also is necessary the establishment of reliable sources for irrigation. Uh, and that's been seen as extensive utilization of non-conventional water. And that's mostly water that's high in salts, especially recycled municipal wastewater uh, that's being used for irrigation. That's the historical move. It's this use of very poor quality water but recently, the water use and non-conventional water use is more uh, about desalinated water. As Israel has moved to large scale desalination for municipal drinking water, a lot of that water is having a lot of effects both on our fresh water quality and our, our recycled wastewater quality. So around half of the water we use in Israel uh, historically is low quality, high salinity water. Uh, characterized uh, in the past by, by very high uh, contents, concentrations of minerals and contaminants, including salts. And the other half is what we call fresh water, which in the past hasn't been such great quality, but in the past 10, 13 years is becoming more and more influenced by uh, desalinated water, both, both the fresh water and the effluent water. And all of a sudden we're dealing with water low in minerals, including salts and nutrients. So uh, that's, the, that's the background that the issues of, uh, in, involving management of irrigation water as a function of its quality and include as, as, as is uh, evident and I'll continue a little bit on salinity, the, the effects of salts on soils and crops, secondary effects and costs of, of leaching those salts. Uh, issues re uh, surrounding recycled wastewater, long-term effects of irrigation on soils that can be the sodium, the dissolved organic matter and other, and other things, uh, other contaminants, including nutrient salts and pathogens in the water, and what uh, people refer to as contaminants of emerging concern, uh, things that we're recently becoming aware of and being able to, to have the uh, analytics to, to discover. There's issues of fertilization and plant nutrition involving interactions and competition in soils and uptake processes uh, when we have nutrients and, and salts together in, in our water sources and our soils. 
and uh, topics uh, around the topic of and the issue of desalination at best brine disposal, uh, especially when it's inland desalination of brackish water, uh, issues of excess boron and lack of other minerals that we that we are used to or like to have in our irrigation water for plants, and secondary effects on the recycled wastewater as uh, as the water coming into our our water treatment processes becomes much uh, lower in salts and higher quality. Uh, we're working in, in the ARO and particularly in the Institute for Soil, Water and the Environment on all of these issues. Uh, just a couple examples of very recent literature reviews, one by Uri Nakshon about salinity and, and soils and, and, and the worldview. Others that I and other colleagues from the ARO have been involved with all in the last year, all published in agricultural water management with different issues and, and aspects of, of dealing with water quality and, and irrigation and agriculture. And, and one that will be coming out next year that I know some of my German colleagues also are involved with and other colleagues at the ARO, which will be a white paper about global soil salinity and should be uh, of, of great interest and, and uh, uh, value for us when it comes out next year. Uh, so a little bit more about salinity. Let's, let's deep in, go, go a little bit deeper about, about uh, irrigation water salinity. I, I'm showing here a, a, a chart where we see a water balance very simple and a salt balance very simple uh, together. As, as irrigators, we're mostly interested in, in quantifying what our transpiration and evaporation of evapotranspiration needs are and being very exact about giving those and avoiding losses other than that. When there's salts in the irrigation water though, then, then the water with the salts flows to the roots. The water's taken up by the roots, most of the salts aren't. The salts build up on the root surfaces and, and accumulate. And if we don't wash those salts out, if those salts aren't leached and in dry areas, rainfall isn't sufficient to leach those salts, then we need to, to give leaching. So irrigation management becomes not only about ET demands, but about leaching requirements and how do we control the salts in, in the system. Now, how do we know how do we approach the questions of how much to irrigate and how much to leach the salts? Well, the, the approaches are threefold. Uh, experimental approaches uh, with both controlled and field experiments. The modeling approaches to identify and understand mechanisms and evaluate sensitivity to factors of interest and to make predictions about how things will go under a, a different scenarios. And applications based on often on the, the models to bring the science and understanding to, to the field and to decision making makers. And, and uh, when we do our best, I think we couple those with, with economics to really allow decisions to be made uh, correctly. So I'm going to give examples of these very quickly. Here we see some controlled uh, freestanding weighing drainage lysimeters. This enables us to control, uh, isolate variables coming in, variables of irrigation water amount, irrigation uh, water quality, and to close, uh, to, to close water balances and solute balances, and to be able to really calculate and see the, the effects of different irrigation management choices or situations on crop growth and on what happens beyond the, the root zone. Example for bell peppers in a net house on the left and for olives in freestanding lysimeters in the Gilat Center on the right. Those kind of uh, uh, tools can give us this kind of results. Here we see water production curves for two salinities, a low salinity and a higher salinity for growing bell peppers uh, in, in uh, a desert uh, area where, where vegetables are grown. And, and this uh, just brings home the need for, for leaching. We see that with the higher salinity, with the crop that's fairly sensitive, we can reach, in this case, the, the same yields that we reached 
with the low salinity water, but at a cost of, of using twice as much water. So half the water is going to, to, leach, this, to leach this salts. The, we see the same kind of uh, results when we looked at, at olives, a more, more uh, uh, tolerant crop, uh, but also to be, to be able to reach maximum yields at any given salinity, we need quite a bit of, of water to, to leach those salts. So we're interested in those salts and we're interested in the water that with the salts and we're interested in the questions of whether that kind of leaching salts is sustainable. So we're interested on a level of, of looking at consequences of, of using the low quality water, where, where, what happens to that water and what does it carry in this example, nitrates into the groundwater downstream from a, a intensive agricultural area in the desert. And some other examples from colleagues of that kind of, of work. We're also interested in uh, sustainability on a larger scale. Uh, uh, in, in the examples of these papers on a, on a national or a global scale. And, and what does it mean uh, down the line? And today we're more and more interested in the role of desalination. Can, can it be leveraged to, to aid sustainability in irrigated agricultural and dry areas? If so, how, what are the costs? The, the second uh, mode of, of work is modeling. I bring three, three examples. One by David Russo and his colleagues where he's doing numerical stochastic modeling for managing spatial variability and getting to best management practices for use in conjunctive use of variable quality irrigation water sources. Fairly sophisticated modeling, but coming in and, and making real uh, suggestions for how management should go. Uh, Shmulek Friedman and his colleagues, Gregory Kalmanarp in particular, and their work with modeling water uptake for trickle irrigation design and work that I'm involved with in, with numerical and analytical mechanistic, mechanistic uh, models based on soil physical properties, water and salt balance, and understood plant response functions in order to predict the response of, of crops under any given uh, salinity and, and leaching. Uh, the last two of, of these have been turned into to tools that go into the third uh, aspect of how we take the science and make it uh, applicable. The first uh, Schmulik's work and his uh, uh, model on, and application DDoS which is a planning tool for optimized design and scheduling of drip irrigation systems that's downloadable and usable and has people using all over the world, both for understanding processes and for actual design of drip irrigation. And a uh, model that an application that I've been involved with developing uh, we, that we call ANSWER, a coupled agronomic economic application for decision-making regarding irrigation with water as a function of its salinity, where a user can choose crops, can choose soils, and can apply real economic data, in, in, in our case for, for Israel, and to predict profit as a function of how much and which water and how much it costs, and, and, uh, and, uh, used and, be, and it's being used as a decision or, or making or planning tool by farmers and planners here in Israel. So uh, to round things up, I'd like to make a list of what I see are obvious uh, potential topics for research cooperation between Elmutz and, and the ARO Volcani, based on, on the same kind of concept of experimental modeling and decision support, uh, uh, a triangle. So the first thing would be to look at water flow and solute transfer in soil crop systems. Next would be to look better and better understand uptake of water and solutes by plants. The transport and fate of contaminants within our soil and agricultural systems and beyond it in the Vedo zone and into the, the into uh, water, water sources, whether they be groundwater or surface water. 
The issue of plant nutrition and nutrient management as a function of water source and soil salinity, it's wide open and a lot needs to be learned. Uh, a little more specifically, uh, would be improving macroscopic water uptake models for cases with combined water and salinity stress and uptake in plant nutrition, uh, nutrient and water uptake and plant nutrition is a function of irrigation water quality, where we look at, would look at nutrient, 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 salt inter interactions. I think uh, these are all things that we could bring uh, symbiotic skills and interests and tools and work on together. So in the name of uh, ARO Volcani, particularly the Institute of Soil, Water, and Enviro si Environmental Sciences, and the southern campus of Volcani, the Greenlot Research Center, where I sit. I thank you and look forward to continuing this discussion. Thank you very much. Thank you, Dr. Belgal. Um, we'll move to uh, Professor Yang Van der Bort. But um, before, I would like to mention that this event is being recorded for all the uh, people that asked, and all the presentations will be shared after so just for you to know and we'll go straight to professor um van der Bort from the institute of bio and Geoscience science of Jülich. um we'll speak about technologies and modeling tools for agricultural crop and climate adaptation research please thank you uh, dear excellencies dear colleagues it's my pleasure to present to you today um, the technologies and modeling tools that we are developing at the Agrosphere Institute at the Forschungszentrum Jülich for agricultural crop and climate adaptation research. So at our institute, we can divide the research teams in three main blocks. We are developing um, sensors for measuring and monitoring plants, terrestrial systems and environmental processes at different scales. We are developing experimental platforms to carry out experiments, which gives us understanding about controls on hydrological and biochemical processes in terrestrial systems. And both the data we obtain with sensors and the insights we obtain from experiments can help us to improve models and simulation tools which, which, with which we can predict um, plant and terrestrial systems from local to continental scales. So a, a number of keywords, we are using technology to develop sensors and experimental platforms that give us or provide us with data uh, and insights which can help us to improve process models. This helps us to give more understanding and insight on the one hand side and in, on the other hand side, it can improve um, our knowledge, or it can lead to a knowledge-based management. So coming to the technologies, um, the first set are imaging methods that we use for non-invasive monitoring of soil processes at different scales. Uh, one example is the magnetic resonance imaging method that we developed together with colleagues from Israel to monitor the accumulation of sodium around uh, roots, which is an important phenomena or process occurring in uh, saline soils and um, occurring in saline soils irrigated with saline water. So we were um, among the first to show how you can monitor basically sodium accumulation in roots using or around roots uh, using MRI system. Another uh, device that was actually um, developed by our engineering department in Jülich is a spectral induced polarization uh, system, which we use for imaging root activities and accumulation of nutrients and salts around the roots, and also for dynamic uh, water content monitoring of date palm trees. This is again a project together with colleagues from Israel where we are where we are applying this technology for a specific agricultural problem. Another met, another instrument that we developed is a mobile low field MRI system which we can use to obtain detailed information about um, soil moisture distributions in 
in uh, bare and dry soils. And this is important to improve models that predict evaporation losses from soils. And it provides us information non-invasively about the water content profile in the first few millimeters of a soil profile. Finally, we are also developing and improving uh, methods and interpretation uh, methods so that we can improve uh, the interpretation of uh, measurements obtained with geophysical methods that we can use for rapid soil mapping and for monitoring soil processes non-invasively at the field scale. The Agrosphere Institute is also um, coordinating an, uh, an, uh, a network of terrestrial observatory sorry, a network of terrestrial observatories. It's called Terino, and it's an initiative um, funded by the Helmholtz Association. And four research centers, Helmholtz research centers are operating these terrestrial observatories in which we monitor the different components of the terrestrial system from the deeper, from the groundwater, the soil, the vegetation into the atmosphere. One component of this uh, network is our soil canalizimeter network, where we installed around 120 um, undisturbed soil monoliths across Germany to investigate in more detail, in more detail and exactly water fluxes and solute fluxes in the soil atmosphere system. We are developing um, um, wireless uh, sensor nets networks that we can directly connect with um, servers and databases to, um, to obtain a real-time monitoring of the terrestrial system. Finally, we are further developing um, analy um, isotopic analytic and sensing platforms that can be deployed uh, outside in the field and which deliver direct information about critical um, biochemical and water fluxes in, in the field. On the experimental platforms, we are currently constructing um, an agricultural food production simulator um, in which we can um, monitor under controlled conditions the development of a crop over the entire cropping cycle. Um, this means that we are constructing large plant chambers that are connected to undisturbed lysimeters so that plant growth is not uh, limited or um, impeded by the limited size of the system. Um, the systems are fully controlled. We can uh, control temperature, humidity, lightning, and we, they are fully airtight so that we can also monitor um, isotope fluxes in these systems, which help us to disentangle different biochemical and water fluxes. This um, experimental platform will give us information that we can use to uh, develop and further parameterize so-called functional structural plant models that we are using and developing, and that we can use then to optimize uh, soil, water, and crop management in a changing climate. So the simulation models that we are developing go from detailed functional structural plant models, which couple the three-dimensional structure of the plant with internal flow and transport processes in the plant so that the function of these organs and the, the function of the structure of the plant can be analyzed in diverse environments. So we can use this model then to generate virtual re realities of plant development, which can then be used to improve um, crop and land surface models that allow uh, predictions of vegetation development and functioning in changing environmental conditions and climate conditions. At the larger scale, we are developing and running in Jülich an uh, entire terrestrial system model or a holistic terrestrial system model, the, the uh, TERSIS and P model, 
which simulates the terrestrial system from the bedrock over the groundwater, the soil, the vegetation into the atmosphere in a fully coupled way. The system is implemented on the supercomputing infrastructure in Jullich, and we can simulate um, the system from the catchment scale up to the continental scale with um, high spatial resolution. So these kind of models can be used to um, evaluate and investigate feedbacks between, for instance, agricultural water use and weather conditions. So the left side shows you the impact of groundwater tables and that are influenced by agricultural water use and the uh, air temperature and duration of heat waves during um, summer in future, uh, for future climate uh, scenarios. The right side shows you the impact or shows that these models can also be used to evaluate the impact of irrigation at certain locations on the continent on the weather and precipitation at other locations in the continent. So this is because the feedbacks in between processes in groundwater, soil and atmosphere are fully accounted for and described. Finally, we are using these models to make forecasts of crop and uh, soil water states for uh, nutrient and water management. So we are predict or so we are developing simulation based products for weather and climate resilient um, agriculture. And we do so by combining operational weather forecasts with um, our environmental sensor data um, into the um, terrestrial system models and run them and provide so that they can provide simulation based products that can be used um, for agricultural management. So this was my last slide and I would like to thank you for your attention. Thank you very much. Um, our next Speaker is Professor Hans Jörg Vogel um, from the Urftet Helmholtz Center for Environmental Research. He will talk about modeling water movement in soils under arid and semi arid conditions. And... Yeah, good afternoon, everybody. Uh, I think it's obvious to everybody here in this route that soils are of critical importance for agriculture. Uh, because they store the water and the nutrients which are just missing when water is short. Uh, but uh, well, <clears throat> I, I don't want to be that bold to try to explain colleagues from Israel uh, how to, uh, what are the critical issues when modeling uh, water dynamics under dry conditions. But still, I think we, uh, I think we, we can have a few uh, areas of research where, where we can uh, very uh, nicely uh, cooperate uh, for the benefit of all of us. Uh, and I, I would like to make uh, uh, two or three points along these lines here. So what, uh, what you see here in this image is uh, an illustration that many scales are involved when you're talking about uh, water in, in soils. So from the local root scale with, or the pore scale to the soil profiles up to the landscape. Uh, and uh, well, the line you can see here just illustrates that whatever we are uh, measuring uh, in soil uh, water relations, it depends uh, on which scale we are looking. <clears throat> and uh, there are two critical scales, I guess. One is uh, the scale of soil profile. This is the scale which is experienced by plants and which is important uh, for agricultural management. Uh, and here the water fluxes are mainly vertical. This is why we can focus on the soil profile. <clears throat> Since the gradients are pointing either downwards or upwards, when it's dry, it's rather upwards. And here the crit critical question is, how does the uh, irrigated or precipitation water is distributed in the soil? Is it uh, stored for, for the usage of plants? Is it lost through surface runoff? 
uh, or it is uh, flowing rapidly downwards below the root zones. That, that's critical for agricultural management. Uh, the other uh, scale which is important in other respect is the landscape scale and the question how are soils with different hydraulic properties distributed in the landscape. This is important for the question uh, how is the interactions between the land surface and the atmosphere, uh, where is surface runoff happening uh, and where groundwater recharge. This depends on how the soils uh, are distributed in the landscape. Also the dynamics of the discharge of the surface waters, of course. Okay, so let's uh, first jump on the scale of soil profiles and what's the state of the art here. Uh, we, we do understand the physics of, of water in porous media quite well, and we have two nice models uh, describing water flow in soil. So we can describe infiltration, uh, very nicely, uh, but there is always a but. This comes along with a number of assumptions uh, which are not necessarily met when we look at infiltration in dry soils, for example. Uh, so one assumption is that we have a complete or at least uh, constant wettability of internal surfaces. Uh, and this is especially critical when uh, organic or soils with organic matter dry is drying out, uh, or if we irrigate with wastewater, as we just heard from, from Aaron Bengal, it's still 33% in Israel, and it's probably coming in, in Germany. Uh, uh, and this water contain organic uh, molecules, which uh, switch to hydrophobic uh, when it's getting dry. And this produces quite uh, strange phenomena in water dynamics. The other assumption is that uh, water content and capillary forces are, in, are always nicely in equilibrium. Uh, and this is also only the case if the processes are very slow. And I mean very, very slow. Uh, if uh, we have a heavy rainfall on a dry soil, water is not distributing in the soil according to some uh, energetic minimum, but it goes where it can easily go to. And this produces also uh, situations where our classical concepts do not really apply. So, we, well, yeah, this is typically not fulfilled when water infiltrates dry soil. And I, I have one illustration for you, an experiment in the lab, because this is difficult to observe uh, in uh, real soil. This is infiltration into a rather homogeneous material. Uh, I can show it again, uh, where the middle horizon uh, both has low capillary forces because it's coarse texture and maybe also problems with wettability. This produces this uh, uh, finger-like flow where the soil is uh, circumvented more or less and rapidly the water is going down to deeper, deeper horizons. Okay, so uh, we made quite a lot of advances uh, during the last, uh, let's say, one or two decades in uh, looking how water uh, behaves in soil at the pore scale. And what you see here is an aggregate. And we look inside these aggregates uh, using X-ray tomography. And you see here the beauty of the pore space, uh, different pore sizes from green, small to red, large. Uh, and we can actually analyze this today in a nicely quantitative way. If it's saturated with water, we can either simulate how it's drying or, or rather, uh, or already we can measure it directly uh, with these X-ray systems. And it was already mentioned by Ulrich Schur and, and Jan van der Borg that these techniques can be used to, to image uh, the 3D root systems as well. Uh, but we are mainly focusing on, on the soil structure, which is also a structure of pores and, and solid, which is critical for all the water storage and water movement, and which actually can be changed by agricultural management. This is uh, where we get a handle on how the soils behave uh, in dry situations. Okay. Uh, but how is this, what, what are the implications at the scale of a soil profile? 
And this was already mentioned by Jan. We have our lysimeter network and soil can all across the, the Helmholtz centers. Here again, the map of the different sites. Uh, and uh, this is uh, really a unique set of data from 140 lysimeters. I think it's, well, anyway, there's a lot of. Uh, and we have 13 different soils here, which are moved around from the two, between the different locations and monitored more than uh, 10 years. Uh, this gives a huge data set, which is absolutely great to really develop further our models also uh, under extreme uh, situations. And just to give you a glimpse uh, of the data coming out of that one, uh, here you see uh, water content and water potential as monitored during one year, 2013. Uh, in the right panel, here you see the precipitation pattern, which was still pretty wet in Germany in, in the year 2018. We had from March to September almost zero, uh, just to, to, uh, uh, to see the difference. Uh, and well, uh, the bad news is that what we typically assume here, this unique curve is not at all uh, met, but we have a, well, uh, a, a, a lot of points not, not lying really on a straight line. Uh, but the good news is that there is a pattern in the data which we can understand and which can, we, can, we can use to improve our models towards dynamic uh, wettability, hysteresis, and things like that. Uh, and here the green and the red trajectory is the dynamics after heavy rainfall uh, following a dry period. This is what I meant uh, before by uh, that these uh, situations are difficult for our classical model approaches to be uh, coped with. Okay, so what about uh, last two slides for, for the landscape scale? Uh, maybe you have seen the UFZ drought monitor, which is online since quite a while and which uh, shows uh, from day to day the actual situation all across Germany. Uh, here you see the def water deficit in, with respect to percentage of fusible field capacity. And this was the situation from one, for one week from now uh, for soil profile one to uh, the first 1.8 meters. And uh, you see these red colors all over the place uh, during the last three years. Uh, and uh, to come up with such uh, predictions, uh, this needs soil information. And this is still not optimal uh, at the moment. And we are working on how to better characterize the distribution of soils uh, in the landscape. And the approach we are following here is uh, to use data from uh, remote sensing, available soil data, data from uh, parent, parent material of soil formation, uh, different qualities of data uh, which are available in a spatially continuous mode so-called proxy variables for soil formation. And we combine this with ground truth where we have real soil data measured uh, at different points. Uh, and these two informations are combined by uh, advanced methods of uh, data science, machine learning, uh, and so on to come up with an estimation, including uncertainties about the distribution of soil uh, properties in the landscape. And this will finally uh, provides us with the required parameter fields to do uh, hydraulic modeling also at the regional scales. Uh, so the good point is that uh, these proxy data, especially those from satellites are steadily improving uh, at the moment. Uh, another good point is that also computing power to do all these calculations <clears throat> is steadily increasing. Well, and the bottleneck at the moment is the availability of the data. And since quite some politicians are here in, in this group, maybe this could be mentioned that we need better access, access to, to soil data, which actually are existing uh, with the different federal agencies, but uh, there is no good, good access from, from a scientific point of view. Uh, this could be improved. 
Well, uh, uh, I would like to end just with a statement that many critical issues are yet to be explored and there are different fields. I, I think uh, Alon Bengal made a nice list of things where we can could collaborate in future. Thanks. Thank you. Um, our next speaker is Dr. Ilan Levin from Plant Sciences Institute uh, Volcanic Center. I will talk about confronting climate changes in Israel, challenges and solutions. Please, Dr. Levin. Thank you very much. Do you hear me? Yes, we can hear you. Okay. Thank you very much. I thank the organizers for giving me the opportunity to present the activities uh, taking place at the Plant Sciences Institute. Although my title is rather general, I'm going to focus on what, on some examples of what we do here. The main challenges as we see it is the uh, temperature, most, not only, but mostly heat, drought, focusing mainly on water use efficiency and salinity. Um, the Institute of Plant Sciences is composed of four departments. Uh, I'm not going to name uh, all of them, but each one of them is uh, 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 dealing on with few aspects of uh, um, uh, uh, abiotic stresses. Uh, the major solutions that we um, uh, devise is introduction and breeding of high yield, high, high quality plant varieties under stress conditions, including vegetables, cereals, fruit and forest trees, development of agriculture and biotechnological technologies to cope with stress condition, conditions, identification and utilization of genes controlling fruit set and food quality under stress condition to expedite, expedite breeding, and the introduction of few non-traditional tolerant crop crops into marginal uh, arid uh, lands. Uh, maintaining crop yield under changing climate, what we do is um, doing the whole set of uh, controlled virus vir versus non-controlled conditions, starting from fully controlled studies up to the field level. Um, Michal Lieberman, a researcher in the Institute, is developing approaches to understand and improve plant response to heat stress under four different level, gen levels, genetic, physiological, epigenetic, and metabolomic. Uh, a group in the Institute have identified quantitative trait loci that control um, uh, uh, pollen uh, quality under high stress. Um, another group is for coping with the means to um, improve potato skin quality under hot climates and you can see here the different types of injuries that high temperature cause uh, uh, potatoes. Another approach, another interesting approach is Parthenocarpic tomatoes, a group currently led by Tzachi Arazi have identified mutant Parthenocarpic tomatoes and then identified the gene and device transgenic and genome edited tomatoes with improved food yield and quality under extreme temperatures. Another group in the Institute has devised the smart plant valve approach that is based on controlling stomatal uh, apparature by modeling sugar metabolism, resulting in increased yield, 20% uh, reduction in water loss, early flowering, cold resistant, and salt uh, tolerance. Another group in the Institute 
is uh, um, formulating treatments to improve the quality of cut flowers in warm uh, climates. Another group is uh, working on uh, controlling uh, soil uh, temperature. And you can see a very nice result of an experiment. Here is a control plot, whereas here, whereas here is a treated plot, and you can uh, observe the difference. Another group of, in the Institute is focusing on breeding cereals for climate change. They're using different approaches, in, including genetic improvement of early vigor to avoid uh, drought. You can uh, appreciate some of the results. And what they found is that early vigor also provide better, better establishment capacity and uh, with competitiveness and also enhances plant efficiency, water use, radiation use, and fertilizers use. These are achieved while minimizing grain yield penalty. Utilizing double haploid technologies, uh, we have um, established a heat tolerant uh, wheat uh, variety called Benedictus uh, 16, which was introduced to the Pope when he visited Israel. Another interesting approach is uh, um, uh, focusing on crop adaptation. A group led, led by Yarl Friedman found that uh, a circadian clock uh, is very important in uh, um, um, adapting plants to different uh, stress conditions. He devised the phenomic uh, um, approach and identifies genes that are associated or controls um, uh, photosynthesis and circadian clock, and then uh, actually tailoring them into, um, into the plant using RICAS uh, approaches. As I mentioned earlier, um, utilizing non-traditional crops into uh, marginal uh, areas. One example is the Aragon uh, tree, uh, which used to be called the iron tree because it's very resilient uh, and is used for oil uh, extraction. And uh, this is a also an approach that we uh, utilize. Uh, traditional and, and new approaches for rain, feed, for rain fed field crops improvement, including crop management, no tillage, crop rotation, water use efficiency, grain quality, precision agriculture, precise fertilization, remote sensing, decision support system, which is led by David Bonfield. Another interesting group in the um, uh, Institute, which can complement some of the activity presented today, is a group led by Maya Kleiman, which focuses on material engineering to elucidate plant environment, environment interactions. Another example is uh, breeding of new apple, apple cultivars with low, low chilling uh, requirements. This is some of the uh, uh, lines and genotypes developed. Uh, and finally, um, improving plant response to uh, frost by chemical uh, priming. Thank you very much. Thank you. Um, so, Thank you to all the speakers. It was really interesting. Um, we had to have now question and answer session, but really uh, uh, out of time here. So um, what we will do is we'll just um, squeeze in two questions and we will immediately start with Stefan Lange, please. Thank you very much. I want to share my screen with you. Uh, 
Hello, uh, shalom and guten tag. My name is Stefan Lange. I'm the research director of uh, Thun Institute, the Federal Research Institute for uh, Rural Areas, Fisheries and Forestries in Germany under the umbrella of our German ministry. And it's a pleasure for us to be part of, of this amazing workshop and to have this brief opportunity to make a concrete collaboration offer because among the collaboration between Helmholtz Association and the Agricultural Research Organization, the World Honey Center, one, of, one aim of this workshop is also to revitalize the intergovernmental agreement of cooperation in science, agriculture and nutrition between Israel and Germany. That's why we concretely uh, suggest a concrete cooperation in terms of food losses and food waste reduction. Some words uh, in terms of the background, the G20 agricultural minister's declaration addresses this topic as an important and crucial one since 2015. And Thun Institute coordinates an initiative of food losses and food waste prevention of the G20 states since 2015. Uh, this initiative was launched at the meeting of agricultural chief scientists of G20 states. Yeah, I am uh, one of the German delegates to this board. We run an expert platform where you can search experts and projects and search for partners in relevant research activities. We annually conduct regional workshops with respective G20 presidency countries. So for two years ago, we conducted such a regional workshop in Buenos Aires for South America and the Caribbeans last year in Tokyo for the South East Asia region. And last week we organized an online workshop for the Gulf region together with Saudi Arabia, for example. On a national basis, Tun Institute is responsible for monitoring food loss and waste in Germany to establish a monitoring system and to uh, also to establish uh, reduction measures. And one of the backgrounds and one of brilliant preconditions for such a potential collaboration uh, is the will and between uh, both ministries. So Julia Klöckner, our German minister, last year in their letter of congratulations to Minister Alan Schuster already mentioned the importance and the wish to cooperate uh, in this key issue, food loss and waste and, and asked for bilateral cooperation also in their meeting with the Israeli ambassador Jeremy Isacharov last year. And furthermore, World Honey Center, one colleague uh, from Israel was requested by his Israeli ministry to contact us at Tune Institute uh, to, uh, for, for potential collaboration uh, in this regard in food loss and waste prevention. So we already started preliminary exchange between our Volcani Center and Tune Institute. And we would uh, suggest a promising cooperation uh, of mutual interest, in, mutual interest. So for example, uh, uh, research collaboration on national measurement and policy strategies on developing and comparing, developing and optimizing monitoring methodologies and to assess and uh, to establish prevention measures and to assess them afterwards. And furthermore, to facilitate and to embed this exchange, this bilateral exchange of knowledge among stakeholders and networks into a more broader, in a more international network and context. This would be our concrete suggestion to revitalize this intergovernmental uh, agreement by launching such a cooperation between our two institutions, asking both ministries uh, for resources for such a uh, collaboration. We would be grateful and would uh, come afterwards to you with this <clears throat> concrete proposal. Thank you very much. Thank you. And let's uh, move immediately to Florian Bittner, please. And um, I also have a very, very uh, short presentation, which I would like to share with you. And um, 
Oh, can you see this uh, presentation? Yes, we can see. Okay. Um, this, uh, so first of all, basically, I would like to uh, say thanks to all the speakers before um, who have so nicely introduced into topics that might be of interest or that presently are already of interest uh, for the collaboration between Germany and, uh, and Israel. Um, just to briefly explain who we are, um, my name is Florian Bittner, I'm the research coordinator at the Julius Kuhn Institute, the Federal Research Center for Cultivated Plants, so I'm kind of a counterpart of Stefan Langer, who has uh, talked to you uh, before. And um, so um, the Julius Kuhn Institute, actually, and just I would like to give you what the idea of the Julius Kuhn Institute is. We're dealing with sustainable plant production, with plant breeding research, plant breeding, plant genetic diversity, plant production, uh, protection, bee protection, plant health, and agrarian ecosystems. And um, as you can see from these points, you may realize that there are several overlaps between the Aro Institutes and other institutes in, in Israel, which um, follow similar lines of uh, research routes. And uh, so no surprise that we have many common interests and some of the current common interests are listed here. And I don't want to go into the details of this, just that we have a very recent um, project idea developed together with the Volcani Center. And this, um, uh, this, this project idea is dealing with herbicide response on major weed species and on the impact of changing climatic conditions. So just as an example of what is going on between us, the Judas Kuhn Institutes, and other, um, in particular the Volcani Center, other research institutes at Israel. So, and um, since I'm not uh, here to talk about the Julius Kuhn Institute in detail, but to ask a question, I would like to address a precise question, which may not be answered here directly, but we might, uh, let's say, add on on what has been talked and discussed previously. So my point is that um, having in mind that so many things are overlapping, so many research foci are overlapping between us, the German research institutions, and the um, Israeli uh, research institutions, I'm wondering whether it could be possible to kind of establish a platform for, uh, for the mutual update of the state of knowledge, maybe could be online biannual or annual or maybe even more often meetings uh, in which the ARO, the JKI, the TUNE and others, the Helmholtz Institutes may come together and uh, establish a platform as kind of a solid basis for the sustainable uh, cooperation between the German and the Israeli um, research institutes. So this is a point from us and uh, we would love to, uh, if, if this idea could be discussed between both of the ministries and uh, maybe uh, because, in particular, because it could be a good idea to establish um, this bilateral cooperation uh, very deeply and very well. Thank you very much. Thank you. And now um, we came to the end of this um, great event. So thank you everyone for participating. We hope you enjoyed it. Thank you to our distinguished speakers and guests of honor. Thank you to the hosts, Andrea from Helmholtz Israel, Vini from Vulcani, Barbara from the Germany, German Embassy. I wish you a big success in the collaborations. I hope to see many of you, many representatives of the collaborating institutes and others in the Green Deal submissions, Horizon and Prima submissions. If you need more information, just contact us. So have a great week, stay safe and healthy, and hopefully see you all soon in person here in Israel. Goodbye. Bye.